We'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm joined by my co-host. Daniel Sanders. I'm the preacher for Norwalk Church of Christ, just south of Cedar Point. Got our summer still going. You can all come over and visit us anytime. Ay, ay, ay. You're always welcome here at North Ridgeville as well. We don't have an amusement park. We don't have things like that. We, I don't know. We're the Crushers. <laughs> the who? I don't even know who. That oh is. yeah, yeah. I forgot. You're not. You're not. Native. I don't know who that is. Minor league baseball team close to you. Oh okay. Huh. Anyway, who knew? Uh, okay, so what we're going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about the kingdom. Last week we began a new series thinking about different how how God's people are referred to in Scripture, different ways they're referred to. So last week we looked at being sheep, being sheep of the Lord's flock. And actually, I, I think when I, when I posted that on actually here on Spotify or, or other places, I put on there, being a sheep sometimes is a, you know, it's seen as a bad thing. Humans like people are, oh, you don't want to be a sheep. It's like, well, that's funny. That's what we're called to be, that we are the, the sheep of the Lord's, um, the Lord's flock. We're part of the Lord's flock. Otherwise, we're, we're like goats. So we're going to be thinking in the upcoming weeks about about other other names or other descriptions given to the Lord's people. So what we're going to be thinking about today is that we are we are called to be citizens of the kingdom. And I was looking at in Ephesians, and let's go ahead and and I'll just read this passage where it speaks about it. it actually, uses three descriptors fairly quickly. This is Ephesians 2 at verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So you have citizens, you have saints, you have members. I think in our in next week's episode, we're going to talk about being a saint. This week, we're looking at citizens. Future episodes, we'll think about being members of the Lord's body. But, you know, here's we think about citizenship and what does it mean to be a good citizen? I think even the world somewhat understands this. You know, if someone is described as a good citizen, Daniel, what are they? What does that mean? Well, one of the things meaning you know you're you're an inhabitant of whatever country you dwell in. Like for instance, us here, we live in the United States. We're citizens of the United States. This word, by the way, is fellow citizen, and it's actually one word. Okay, and it's like yep. na- it is native of the same town is basically what it means. So it's to that idea, it's like we are together citizens of whatever we're talking about. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. So one of the things, one of the, one of the critical things I think for us as, as citizens is being a law abiding. There are rules or regulations, ordinances in each area we are living in. And so there's that need to abide in those laws and ordinances, regulations, whatever you want, however you want to describe them, there are different things that we're to follow. And being a Christian is no different where we have laws and commands that we're to follow and abide in. One of the things that I think about is Matthew seven twenty one, where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, center the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. There's things that we have to do. We have to do God's will to be part of his kingdom. And again, as Paul is saying here, we're to be fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. So you and I, as Christians, we are to be one together with one another, but also abiding and following in those commands. Because Jesus said there, again, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, that if we don't do God's will, we're not going to enter into heaven. And if we don't do God's will, then there's also consequences of him saying, depart from me. So there's a need for us to be able to understand the importance of being a citizen and taking that with all seriousness. Yeah. And the whole, you know, people have the idea that 
that in Jesus, because the Bible talks about free, being free, yeah. that we have been freed from bondage. We've been free from sin. That that does not mean we have permission to do whatever we want. Exactly. It's not that, a matter of, you know, this whole universal idea that people have come up with of, you know, we can do whatever we want and God will accept us. That's yeah. not what being a citizen is you know we can't establish our own right that's anarchy is yeah, what that is exactly that's that's that, chaos that's chaos and, and that's why when people look at the religious landscape today and they're like man what is going on here where you have a different church on every corner of every corner in town teaching something different and they're like that's not right we're the ones who say that's not right yeah <laughs> it's not right and you know and then so we see the the disputes, the disruptions, we see all, all these different things that are happening and we're not being that fellow citizen and that fellow joining together. You know, when we think about the idea of being what you're talking about with being a fellow citizen, it's important for us to be one with one another. But that one is not based on what you and I are thinking. It's based right. on what God is yep. thinking yep. and what God has said. Yeah. And what Jesus as king. And it's like all authority has been given to him. And yeah. we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go along. So. Here in Ephesians, like I said, I thought we might just camp out here in Ephesians for the for the most part. We can stray a little bit to other books, but but here I, I just made a few notes in Ephesians. For one thing, no longer strangers, the verse that we just read. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. And it's important for us to see who he's talking to, I think, because we're talking about the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. And that all of a sudden, and we'll we'll read the the verses right before this here in just a second. But in the kingdom, we are we are within the Lord's kingdom. And I guess one thing we should say, and we'll emphasize this here again in a second: the kingdom has been established. Yes, a lot of people out there believe the kingdom has not been established. Jesus makes it pretty clear when he talks about there were those standing who would not see death till they see the kingdom come. Um, I think Colossians makes it even more clear when it talks about he has conveyed us or translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. The kingdom has been established. Yes. It, it has been established. Jesus is ruling. Whether people want to submit to him, obey him, that's on them. But he has all authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. So here the Gentiles... In Ephesians 2, and all of a sudden, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. And I was thinking about this idea of, of strangers and, and foreigners, because in some ways, in the Lord's kingdom, we are fellow citizens. But what it reminded me of, and I said we weren't going to deviate from Ephesians, now I'm going to deviate, sorry. But it reminded me of, of Hebrews chapter 11, when it's talking about those who are faithful in Hebrews chapter 11 at verse verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off <coughs> were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. So in, in a way we are strangers and in a way we are not strangers. And I think to sort of summarize the two ideas, when you're in the Lord's kingdom, the world seems foreign to you. And when you're in the world, the kingdom seems foreign to you. And that it is a contrast between two systems, if you want to put it that way. I'm not sure if I like symptoms, um, but it's a question of in or out of the kingdom. Yeah that the Gentiles before they were outside. So therefore Ephesians says you're not outside anymore because in Christ you're no longer a stranger and it's you're no longer a stranger to God that you've now been brought near by the blood of Jesus. I think I think about you know I'm I'm, I'm pulling what you just did. I'm I'm deviating a little bit as Don't well. Don't you dare. I know. Don't Col you dare. Colossians 3 verse 11 <laughs> There's neither J Greek nor Jew, circumcised yeah. nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. It's a matter yeah. of, you know, if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, there's going to be blessings from right. it. it. It's not a matter of your classification of people at all. 
uh, right. uh, where you were or who you are. It's a matter of you being in Christ and yeah. abiding in God's uh, will and, and following through with those things. That's if, what matters. If you are submitting to the king, yes, then you are in the kingdom and you are no longer strangers. You are no longer estranged from God. You've yeah. been brought near. But as you've been brought near, where you came from, uh, in that sense, we are strangers to the world. And that we, we like Abraham and the others, declare plainly that this world is not our home. And that's, you know, when Jesus goes to the cross and he's talking to Pilate. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And, and so in that sense, are we that we are no longer strangers in the kingdom. We are fellow citizens, but to the world, we are estranged. Yeah. And and to use, to use that language, one is foreign to the other. And it's when one stops being foreign to the other. Oh, that's when you, you start getting into all sorts of trouble and you, and it's like a man can't serve two masters. Nope. You're either submitting to the King or you're not. You're either in the kingdom or you're not in the kingdom. And if you're not submitting to the king, then you're not in the kingdom. Yeah. Is is basically what it comes what it comes down to. So here in Ephesians, as it talks about fellow citizens, to look at the preceding verses, and, and I think you already touched on this, talking about in Christ, there is you don't have these these classes, to put it that way. For he himself is our peace, verse 14 who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two and thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He came and he preached peace to you who are afar off and peace, pardon me, peace to you who are afar off and to those who are near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. There's not two kingdoms. <laughs> no. There's not a kingdom for the Jews and a kingdom for the Gentiles. It's like there's one king. There's one kingdom. There's one law. Absolutely. There's just there's this oneness of everything. And, you know, I was just doing a lesson Sunday night on something similar to this from Acts chapter 15, where the Jews and the Gentiles, they had this council, they were, they came together there in Jerusalem and there the Jews were, they were trying to, well, the Gentiles, they need to go back. They need to kind of revert back to the law. And Paul was sitting there speaking. Peter was speaking about you know, Christ has come to us to be able to go to the Gentiles, to be able to speak to the Gentiles. And it's the same message. It's not a matter of fulfilling those old law ordinances. Right. We're established in a new law, a new being. We're able to have, as, as you just read there for us, Christ has broken down the middle wall of separation. Peter was going to be a little bit more effective with the Jewish brethren, more or less. And Paul, Jesus said there to, to Ananias in Acts 9, he's a chosen vessel of mine. He's going right. to go to the kings and Gentiles and Jews. He's going to go to all these different people, and he's going to be effective in those different works of being able to preach the one gospel to all these different people. And it's a one same gospel for everyone. It's not, you know, there's no partiality with God. There's nothing of these things of being able to say, okay, the Jews are going to receive this gospel. That 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 doesn't make us fellow fellow citizens with God. There's that, there would be a personal favoritism then, but there's nothing with that when it comes to God. And here, you know, as it talks about having abolished in his flesh, the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Like you said, that passage there in Acts, where one of the points is they they were not deciding what to do. They were recognizing what God had revealed. Yes. And it's like the Holy Spirit has made it clear God has granted unto the Gentiles repentance. It's like the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius, so those with him, and you have the miracles as they were being done. It's like God's made it clear. Yeah. Stop trying. So don't try to bind old covenant practices. Don't try to bind circumcision. Yeah on the Gentiles that according to this passage abolished in his flesh, the enmity that is the law of commandments. And now we have unity. We have fellow citizenship. Yes. And that's to your passage there in Colossians. And it's that same thing is repeated elsewhere. And it also in Galatians, Galatians where you sort of have the same, you know, the same thought process. There's neither male nor female. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. And it's, we are all one in Christ, fellow citizens 
if you're in the kingdom, you're in the kingdom. And the whole classification system, I think that's that's something that sometimes folks uh, have trouble with. Just thinking of, for example, in certain religions where there's clergy, laity, and they're not recognizing it as a kingdom of priests. And that's that's for another discussion, though. But but here is we we look at this idea of of fellow citizens and it's one king in, in Ephesians chapter one at verse. So Ephesians one, let's look in verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, down a little bit further, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Oh, yeah, come down to verse verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality, power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That verse emphasizes a Jesus, but it also emphasizes talks about his body, the church. Yeah. People think, oh, well, you can be a part of the body and not be a part of the church. The church is his body. They think you can be saved outside of the body. He's the savior of the body. And so that's why the church is so important because it is the church that is the kingdom. And it's, it's in the church where we submit to Christ yeah. that he is the head of the church. He's supreme. He's supreme. And that, in those verses really pinpoint his, his, his superiority over everything where he sit at the right hand of God. Again, we look at that as a, as a place of power and everything as well, but also it goes on far above any other dominion, any other principality, any other might or dominion or any power that's yeah. ever come across that is present at that time or come, you know, that speaks about you know, how we think about how great right. and mighty our nation is. Yeah. Now or in the future. And now, you know, you look at the future of everything. We look at our country and how great, mighty and powerful, you know, our country is said to be still nothing compared to the might and power that God yeah. has given to Christ. Yep. And it, it echoes what Jesus said in Matthew 28, you know, there when it's all authority, all authority. in heaven and on earth, Yeah, like not just earth in heaven as well. Yeah. And that he is all these things. He put all things under his feet. And that the father gave him this authority. And so we recognize him as supreme. He is, he is the king. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. And we bow the knee as, as this verse speaks about that he, and every name put him over every name that is named Jesus, the name above all names. And so we recognize him as, as King. And it just floors me now at, at that point that there are people who think the kingdom is not established. Yeah. It's because, interesting. See, it's interesting seeing that, you know, people still looking for the Messiah, looking for yeah. a kingdom to come. I mean, there was that discussion happening there early on in acts where they were, when are you going to establish your physical kingdom? You know, that's not, that's not what we're worried about. We're focused on Christ has established a kingdom. He yeah. has established and it is an eternal kingdom. I mean, that verse that I referenced uh, a minute ago when he's talking to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my disciples would fight. And we're going to talk about the weapons of our warfare not being carnal here in a minute. But it's like people are still looking for Jesus to come establish an earthly kingdom and set up an earthly throne and to start an earthly war. And it's like that's not that's not ever been what the kingdom yeah. was going to be. From the very beginning, he said, no, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my disciples would fight. He tells Peter to put the sword back in his sheath. He is reigning. To say that the kingdom that the kingdom has not been established is to say that Jesus' rule has not been established. Yeah. It's like, no, his rule has been established. That God has, has done these things and that he has, he has authority. And so when we think about the kingdom and it's like, are you submitting to the king or not? And, and that's what we are, 
that's what we're called to do. Um, let's see, where do we want to go from there? Concerning the king, concerning the kingdom, I, I think to your to the point that you pretty much started with, a kingdom has laws. Yeah, absolutely. And in Ephesians chapter 3 and 4, you know, as, as Paul talks about the mystery being revealed, that these things, namely that Gentiles would be a part of the body, that that as they were added as they were added to the body, as God accepted them through Jesus, that all of a sudden now it was understood, it was revealed, Ephesians 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And, and so I was just thinking about the idea of laws being written down, that these things are written down so that we can read it and we can understand it. This, this idea, and especially chapter 4, actually chapter, actually chapter 3, verse 14, for this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it shows that subjection with everything. Yeah. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The, we are fellow citizens. Chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And so that there points out the need to obey. There, yeah. There's a need. Yeah. There, 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 there's a certain aspect of following God's law. It's not a matter of just establishing your own will or your own righteousness. There was that problem that Paul wrote about with Israel. They established their own righteousness and not submitted to the right. righteousness of God. Right. They turned away from God. And so as Paul points out there, I didn't mean to take it away from you right there, but no, you're right. that idea of walking worthily, it matters to God how we live our life. Right. God has set his will, has set his commands, has set it all in place for us. And now it's up to us to meet that measure, to walk in that proper way. And he goes on from there in, in verse one to kind of what you're getting ready to lead into of the importance of unity. The importance of right. one matters to God. This idea of fellow citizens. And we're going to talk, by the way, next week as we talk about saints and that idea of being holy. We're going to deal with a question, and I think the verse answers it honestly. I don't. I think a lot of people don't believe we can have a walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. They're like, oh, that, that's not even possible. Well, it must be possible because that's what we're commanded to do. Yeah. And that's what we're called to do. But we'll, we'll save that discussion for next week. But here, just the idea of there are expectations. Yes. And as you have the unity of the Spirit being spoken about in the next verses, and we have the spiritual gifts, and that the Lord gave these spiritual gifts doing these things until, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that we should no longer be children, verse 14, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. May grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every part supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The standard has been revealed. It's been written down. When we read it, we can understand it. The gifts were given the gifts that were revealing God's word, that were confirming God's word. He was doing all these things, equipping us till we should all come to the, as it talks about, till we should all come so that we should no longer be children tossed and fro. Can you imagine any kingdom, any kingdom, not writing law, their laws down, <laughs> their expectations? What does it mean to be a good citizen in the state of Ohio? And it's like, it's written down. It's all written down for us. You know, if, if you don't have that written down, you mentioned it earlier, it, it's complete anarchy. You could say, yeah. well, I think it's this. And then you, you, you could change it every minute. And right. then what happens? As fellow citizens, we don't know what the law is. Yeah. You, you know, you could be sitting there. For instance, I know this be sounding a little bit off there, but, you know, in Ohio, we have speed limits. Like out here on our road, it's 35 mile an hour. Well, there, if there was a cop sitting out there today, he could be like, well, today I feel like it's going to be 20 yeah. or it could be 58. You know, I don't know whatever, whatever yeah. the case may be. If we change the law of everything constantly, there's no order of anything. There's no ability to be able to yeah. follow or acknowledge. It's just kind of just do whatever you want. That's the nature of the king of, of a kingdom. Yeah. That is the nature of it. The king has authority. 
What does authority imply? Commandments. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, as we began, but he who does the will of my Father. And it's like, there is a will, and it has been revealed. There was a time where it was not written down. Yeah. The gifts were given. The church was in its infancy. And it was written down so we would not be like children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. It's like, no, it's written down now. We have the truth. It's been revealed. When we read it, we can understand it. We can know the king's will. The king has come. The kingdom has been established. And that's the nature of the kingdom. Chapter 5, as it talks about walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. We'll talk more about that next week. I wanted to make the point, because the next passage talks about marriage. The end of chapter 5 talks about marriage. As, as earthly marriages are meant to be a reflection of Jesus and his church. Chapter 6 gets into children and parents. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Verses 5 down through the next few verses deals with bond servants and masters. And I wanted to make the point that the kingdom should permeate every part of our lives. We are citizens of the kingdom. We're not just citizens of the kingdom on Sunday in between 9.30 and noon. Yeah. And that's how, unfortunately, we see sometimes it looks. You know, we oh, look yeah. at that. And we look at that and it's like, okay, I just got to be, I got to be that good Christian. I come in. I'm going to swallow down my Lord's Supper. I'm going to put a little money in the collection plate. I've done all I need to right. do. That's all I need to do to in my life right. to be able to be serving God. I mean, it'd be like saying, I'm an American on Sunday from 9 to noon. Yeah. It's like, no, no one would say that. Right. It doesn't work that way. We see it all. Yeah. We see the importance of, you know, it, uh, you know it, we get that encouragement or that strength to build us up on the, that 9.30 sure. to noon that you're talking about all the time. Uh, other places might have different times, and nonetheless. Um, Don't but, make me come across <laughs> this table. <laughs> but uh, as we look at this, it, it's those are those moments to help us continue on. Yeah. You know, I think, I think outside though, I'm not saying that's less important, but it's more important because we're not near our brothers and sisters all the time. We're out here in the world trying to help others be those fellow citizens uh, in the world. And so we take time of this opportunity to be able to recharge ourselves, rejuvenate, being able to do this work together to go and do our work right. as Christians to help others in all aspects of our life. And this is what kingdom citizens do. It's like citizens of the kingdom do, do this on Sunday. Citizens of the kingdom do this in their marriages. King citizens of the kingdom do this with their children. Citizens of the kingdom go to work this way, whether they're masters or servants, this is what the kingdom permeates every part of our lives. We are citizens of the kingdom continually. Yeah. And we submit to the king continually. We are always a citizen. So that's chapters 5, chapter 6. And then the tail end of chapter 6 is putting on the whole armor of God. And when we think about kingdoms, you know, I'm, I'm just mindful of how the David and Bathsheba account begins when David, oh, how does it phrase it? That it was the time when the time when kings went out to war. And of course, David was not with <laughs> David was not with soldiers. Probably should have been. It's for another lesson. But anyway, that the nature of kingdoms is there is a time there is a time to go to war. You put on the whole armor of God, and I think it's in it Colossians where it's you have the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I, I think that's so. I believe that's Colossians. If I'm remembering correctly, I could be wrong about that. Um, but it seems like that's the case, but here it's speaking about the same thing that the, that here, as we put on the whole armor of God, that there is a time to, and as we think about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, second just Corinthians like 10, 14, second Corinthians 10. Yeah. 10 failed, verse four. I failed I miserably. I Sorry, you, got, you got the first letter, right? And the second letter. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, but when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, and that if it was, my soldiers would fight. And he's talking about the same thing, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. And let me let me read that passage. Where did you say it was? 2 Corinthians 10.4. You got it? Yeah, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Yeah, casting, casting down, down arguments. arguments and every high thing yeah. that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There you go. That's kingdom language. That is strong kingdom language. Yeah. That's what we're trying. That is what the Lord wants us to do. And I'll tell you right now, sometimes people have a lot of trouble with that. Absolutely. And they, they think that Christians ought to just be hmm, spiritual marshmallows. Yeah. Soft, gooey, you know, sweet. And it's like, no, they're, it's you put on the whole armor of God. Yeah. You take the shield of faith. You have the sword of the spirit. You have the breastplate of righteousness. You, have, you shod your feet with the gospel of peace. You do all these things. You all protect yourself entirely for you're going out and fighting. And we, we recognize, you know, as it speaks about, that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're in the kingdom we are behind, oh, you know, I was reading in, in, oh, I do daily videos for, um, put them on our Facebook page. And I was reading in Jeremiah for one of our upcoming videos, I believe it's Jeremiah, where Jeremiah's in prison when Jerusalem is conquered. And, and when Jeremiah writes about it in Lamentations and it talks about your wall and your ramparts are torn down. And he says, and he was just weeping. And it, the whole thing just made him sick. But those were physical walls and physical ramparts. And frankly, the Lord was still with Jeremiah. But anyway, when we think about the kingdom today, it's like, no, we have walls and we have ramparts. And we have the armor of God because we know who's on the other side. Yeah. We know who's outside. We know the devil is roaming around seeking whom he can devour. And that's why we're in the kingdom. And that's why we put on the armor of God. And that's why we do all these things to stand against the devil. As it speaks about verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And we better be, not be naive. I know you were telling a story. I won't tell you to repeat the whole story, but you're talking about the, the devices of the devil. Yeah. That we are not ignorant of his devices. Right. Ignorant of his, of his workings, his, what he, what he uses, yeah. everything he can wield, yeah. uh, you know, his work, his, his own personal workmanship, not be ignorant of those things. Be aware of them. Yeah. You know, and we are, Peter writes to be sober, be vigilant, yeah, exactly. Be clear minded, be focused. Be active, you know, as you look at those, I know yeah. those words don't say, but that's what he's saying. That's what he's getting at. And that's what Paul's getting at here about yep. the whole protection of everything yep. is to protect every vulnerable point of your body, protect it. God has offered it and you can be able to stand. Chapter five, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. Uh, that word circumspectly. I always remember the word study just because it's a good one circumspectly spectly is looking and circum is around like circumference of a circle namely pay attention to your surroundings and if you're a soul if you're a soldier and if you're in the lord's army congratulations you're on the winning side yeah because we know who our king is I'm but don't don't think that there's not an adversary oh yeah i'm, I'm reminded uh, when i was younger the boss i was working for we'd be driving and he would sit there and, and give us you know we'd be driving and next thing you know he'd say well what did you notice back there you know, just a minute ago, looking all the, what it was is he was trying to get you to look at your surroundings, be aware of your environment that you're in, yeah. not just be completely naive of everything. You need to be aware of it for safety purposes because, yep. you know, I was I was working in downtown, not in the most favorable parts of city in, in uh, down southern Ohio and continue with those things. He just. Be aware of your surroundings. Just look around. And that's the right. same type of mentality that has been still in my mind and what Paul's writing here as well to just be aware of your environment. Know what Satan's trying to do to try to get you to uh, give in to those temptations or those urges to turn away from God. Be careful. Be careful. And exactly. And and be careful all the time. Yeah. Be fo it's, you know, oh, it's easy. We, you know, when we're in, when we're protected in that hedge, there at, at our church building, you know, usually we're able to be in a good spot with fellow brothers and sisters. If, yeah. the, if the devil can get in there, he'd he, love it. Oh, yeah. He'd love it. There's and a little for, bit more. There's even more on guard because there's so many eyes. But when we're out in the world, 
we don't have the same amount of eyes. That's why we have to do it ourselves. Right. It depends on us to be able to walk in in a worthy manner and also to be aware of things. Yeah. And I feel like each each circumstance has its own temptation. And what yeah. I mean by that is when we're out in the world, it's like, okay, we're out in the world. You better be on guard. But then we let our guard down when we go to it's church. Yeah. You know, and it's like, know. uh, sometimes stuff happens in church and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, you better look around. Yeah. In our families, sometimes it's like, oh, you better, you better look around in your families. Yeah. You, you know, e- even Strength here is encourage each other. Yeah. Yeah. And to be those fellow citizens together. You know, there's times where. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of families. You know, when when all of that was happening with Job and the devil is coming after Job with everything the Lord's letting him get away with. Right. And and the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And Job attacks his health. Job attacks his. Satan. Pardon me. Satan. <laughs> Satan attacks his wealth. Satan attacks his health. Satan attacks family. Satan does all those things. And there Job is, and he doesn't sin. And then his wife comes to him and says, why do you hold your integrity, curse God, and die? And she's doing the devil's bidding at that yeah. point. And she experience, you, well, we see she's experiencing the same things that Job's experiencing, sure. but we see she took it. She, it hurt. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to sure. admit that it didn't hurt. It hurt. And, and here it was her. Her way of handling it and going about it versus what Job was right. doing. We and see I'm both sure sides of it. She thought she was doing the right thing. Yeah. But Just she get it do- over with. Get yeah. o- No more pain, no more right. suffering with that. Just get it over with. Here's and, how you can do it. And that was that was what the devil wanted. Yeah. And sometimes our family does that. It, the devil, the devil's looking for any opening. Any opening to be able to, any vulnerable point. Yep. To be able to try to get us to stumble. So we got to be kingdom citizens. We got to be ready because we bow the knee to Jesus. And we're thankful that that he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and that he's with us. And so whenever I think of the kingdom, you know, I'll, I'll quote, these are my final thoughts. You know, I just think of, of the safety that's found in the kingdom. I think of the sustenance that's found in the kingdom that the Lord provides for us and that you have, like we've spoken about, you have order yeah. in the kingdom and you just have all those blessings and found in the kingdom. It's like, you don't want to be outside, right? Outside it's dogs and sorcerers and immoral and anarchy, anarchy, chaos, every evil thing. And it's no come into the walls of the kingdom. So Anyway, that's my final thought. You got anything else you want to mention, Daniel? Again, uh, you know, thinking about you know that discipline, that subjection that we're to have. It all comes from God provides those things, and we're to continue to discipline our bodies, bring it into subjection. As you were pointing out, the you know, need to be a citizen, the need to retain, you know, using a kind of law and order. But God has given us His commands to follow. We're to listen to those things, take advantage of those things, bring ourselves into into discipline in all aspects. As you, as we were pointing out here. In our discussion, it's important for us to seek and serve God in his way, not just yeah. our own personal righteousness. It's, it's what it means to be a citizen of his kingdom. Yeah, it's yep. his kingdom and he is in he is the head of all things to his kingdom. There you go. Appreciate you, Daniel. Appreciate everything as well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Appreciate it. And we hope you join us next week for another study. But we, we certainly thank you for... Um, for being with us, for joining us on this in these studies and on this journey as we strive to be looking to Jesus.